Hi, this is John Curtis, and you're listening to the Beat Two Football Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the V2 Football Podcast. I'm Chris Lappard. I'm delighted to be joined online by former Man United at Exeter City defender Alan Tong. How are you doing this evening, Alan? Yeah, hi, Chris. How are you doing? You okay? A bit sniffly, but I'm alright. <laughs> Just getting over a bit of cold. Oh, uh, so it's plenty around at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, firstly, how, how did you get into the game? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I've sort of, uh, like, like any young lad, really. I think um, my dad, my dad was a big Manchester United supporter, and uh, I can remember being uh, knee high to a grasshopper playing football. You know, lots of lots of photographs with me in nets in the back garden and things like that. Yeah. And um, it just evolved from there, really. I think traditional, like most youngsters, have played in the school teams, and um, I managed to get I managed to get into some. Uh, representative football. I, I represented my town, which was Bolton. Played for Bolton School Boys. Yeah. And um, that that sort of ended up that evolved to playing. I got uh, picked to play for Greater Manchester County, which was the next step up. And then and from there, uh, Manchester United was uh, was scouting, and uh, they invited me to to go down one Christmas for, for a trial. Yeah. So how how does the trial process work back then? Well, back then, I think I was around, I think I was about 14 and a half, 15 yeah. years old at the time, and uh, got a letter through to say um, they invited me down over one Christmas period. Yeah. And uh, I think it was, um, I'm not too sure if it was if it, if it was sandwiched between Christmas and the New Year. I think I spent, I spent New Year's Eve in Manchester University Hall as a residence. That's where we stayed back then. Yeah. Uh, I think I think the trial started about the 28th of December, something like that. Uh, they invited us to a game over that period, you know, to watch the first team. And I think we went through to about the 3rd of January, something like that. So it was, you know, it was, it was over the new year, uh, mm. the, the trial period. Yeah, so you joined the club about the same time as the great Alex Ferguson. Um, did you ever meet him? Or? Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Sir Alex joined in November 1986. Yeah, and uh, I just started training as a as a schoolboy at the time. Uh, I used to go down to the Cliff Training Ground, United's old training ground, uh, twice twice a week on a, a Monday night and a Thursday night. I think we trained from something like six till seven or seven till eight. And um, shortly after Sir Alex had joined, I was I think he wanted to lay a marker down straight away, and he was yeah. He was quite interested in signing uh, some of the, the local boys, some of the, the local uh, youth players. So I was I was fortunate enough uh, to get offered uh, term schoolboy forms yeah. and an apprenticeship. Uh, Sir Alex had not been there long; he'd only been there a month or two when he when he sort of offered myself and a, and a few other local lads uh, an opportunity to uh, to sign schoolboy forms and, and become an apprentice when when I left school. Mm. So did he ever come down to the youth teams and like an imposer club philosophy on the throughout the whole club? Or? Uh, absolutely, I think I think Sir Alex straight from from coming into Manchester United, he was he was always there. He used to watch uh, a lot of the, the B team games. The uh, the way it worked back then is you had you had like four teams in Man United. The first team, the Reds, is the A team and the B team. Yeah, the B team the B team were usually uh, made up of. Sort of school boys and maybe a couple of first year apprentices. The A team was more open age. You used to get some of the uh, the older apprentices and some of the some of the younger pros involved in the A team. Yeah. And so it's, and the, the way it worked back then is the B teams and the A teams used to play. You know, similar to today in the morning on Saturday mornings. And if Manchester United's first team had a game in the afternoon, so they were about three o'clock kickoffs back then. You know, obviously. There's a lot of there's all sorts of kickoffs these days, Sundays, Mondays, etc. But Sir Alex had come down and watched the B team and the A teams before going off to the first team in the afternoon. So, so you were you were quite aware of his presence, and uh, you know it was quite exciting to, to sort of glance over your shoulder and, and used to see Sir Alex and Archie Knox, who was his assistant manager at the time, yeah, uh, keeping an keeping an eye on the youth, and you know it was even you know more fantastic that. 
had Sir Bobby Jowen used to come down and watch on occasions, and, and even Sir Matt Busby. Yeah. Uh, you, you notice Sir Matt coming watching the the sort of the youth teams as well on occasions, which was you know in, incredible for a, you know like I was a Man United supporter, so it was incredible to experience that. Yeah, I read today that they got a uh, name on the stands after Bobby Charlton. So that's, that's, they what, sorry? They got, a, they got a name on the stands after Bobby Charlton. That's right, yeah, yeah. they've announced it today on the, the, the South Stand, yeah. which is, uh, you know, it's, it's that, that, that accolade's more than due. I know, I know we've got the Trinity outside the front of the ground, but I think, you know, Sir Bobby is an absolute legend yeah. at Manchester United, so that's more than well rewarded getting a stand named after him, which is absolutely fantastic news. Yeah, I remember I went on the Manchester Old Trafford tour, and it's the only time I've ever yeah. been starstruck in my whole life was when I met uh, Dennis Law. <laughs> so, so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just wandering absolute around. Legend. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Right, so, so you're part of the club when they revamp and the youth set up. Um, how much yeah, did yeah. you notice the change over the years? Was it? It's a completely different well, from eighty six to. Yeah, I think, I think right, you know, going going right back to the Busby days in the fifties, United's always an, had an identity. Of, uh, of trying to bring youth players through, or you know, or certainly um, throughout our history, we, we pride ourselves on doing that. So I think what Sir Alex was doing is when he first sort of came uh, came into the club in November '86. I think he tapped into sort of Matt Busby's um, uh, philosophy of you know trying to trying to bring through youth players into the first teams and. And they had, you know, back back when I was playing, they, they had like a crop that was known as the Fergie's Fledglings. Yeah. Uh, which incorporated a lads like Lee Martin and Daniel Graham. Uh, there was a lad called David Wilson, Ruffle Beardsmore, uh, Lee Sharp, Juliano yeah. Majorana. They, they were the sort of first group. Tony Gill, uh, they, they were the first sort of group who got an opportunity to play in the first teams. And... Um, and then, obviously, as, as the sort of club developed, we ended up in, you know, with the, the infamous class of 92, didn't we? Yeah. The, uh, which, which involved, you know, represent lads who played in the first team hundreds and hundreds of times between them. Skulls, Giggsy, the Neville brothers, uh, Nicky Butt, uh, all, all, all went on to make, you know, several hundred appearances between them all. So that, that was sort of a, you know, prop, prop, Arguably the best youth crop that, that football's ever seen. Mm. How intense is the training at Man United at a youth level? Um, well, I think I think it, I think it's more it's different. I think you I think in the modern day you're sort of more uh, you, you, cared for is probably the, the wrong term, but mm. I think you you sort of you you're not it's not as you know the, the intensity's there, the demand's there, but yeah, I think you sort of your um, cared for in relation to appearances I think when I was playing we used to have like you played for your school team you played for your for Man United on a Saturday you had a Sunday club and it, you know it was it was maybe too much and yeah. I think from, from my sort of era there's, there seems to be quite a lot of people who had like ankle problems and knee problems and back problems and things like that I think I think these days the young players at Manchester United are it, it, they're more carefully monitored. I don't. I think if you're involved and you signed with the academy, you're not you're not allowed to play for anybody outside of the academy. No. So um, I think I think you sort of your, your training's more kept an eye on. So is the the focus you know, greater on so the physical aspects of the game rather than the technical aspects of the game back then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, you know, with with the with the sort of the uh, sports science taking over and. Um, strength and conditioning coaches and uh, technical coaches and things like that. I think I think there's more stru- rigid, structured programs these days. There's like individual learning plans for a lot of players, mm. uh, and they all they all work on different aspects of the game, whether that be speed, fitness, uh, you know, go- going on to sort of control, passing, heading, tackling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think everybody gets like a rigid learning plan. And, and sort of ideas to that, and I think as well going into the first team level, there's, there's sort of a lot more uh, focus on things like keeping an eye on urine samples and blood samples and things yeah. like that, you know, to see if you're showing signs of fatigue. So it's really, really advanced over the years. I think all we used to get when I was back at the club was just used to keep keep an eye on your weight. You used to get weigh-ins every so often. So, yeah. uh, so from the science, scientific aspect. 
perspective, he's really advanced over the last 20, 25 years. So at a club the size of United, do the coaches still give you enough time and attention as an individual or as a, or as a team? Well, it, it's, 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 again, it's a difficult call. I think, I think traditionally, a lot of coaching takes place with the sort of squad, with the team, but I think, I think maybe further advancement, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think there should be more defensive coaches, midfield coaches, uh, forward coaches. And I don't mm. know if you watch um, Soccer AM on Saturday. There's a lot yeah. on there at the moment who does a little bit of work with, I think different players go to him and he really, really works on the technical aspect. You know, looking at how you uh, get your first touch on the ball, where you're getting your first touch on the ball, where that touch is going, yeah. what your body positions are, what you're doing. I think more and more of that will probably advance in the game. You know, when I when I was playing, it was just you used to work on shape and stuff like that, but it was more of a collective. Whereas I think these days, I think everybody's different. I think there should be more. I think there should be more uh, coaches like who look after the full backs or the centre halves. Mm. Or you know, because every 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 position's got different demands to it. Yeah. And if you were if you were a coach where you used to be a centre forward, I think that sometimes can be difficult to coach the defenders. I mean. We had a youth uh, team manager called Eric Harrison when when I was there, and Eric yeah. was an old defender. Eric was a centre half when he was a player, so he was fantastic on the back four. And uh, we used to have like Kid, Brian Kidd was there as the youth as a youth manager as well when oh. I was at the club, and he Kid all used to focus on the forwards and the wingers and things like that. So we had like a nice mix, but you know traditionally on a on a typical morning you'd probably train as a group and work on shape and things like that. So I think more individualised coaching will probably grow in, over this next few years. Mm. So do you feel that young players have it too easy compared to your day? Or... I think, yeah. I, I probably, there probably is an argument, Chris, to say that uh, they, they do. I mean, mm. when, when we were when we were coming through as apprentices, we kind of it, we was absolutely petrified on knocking on the first team. <laughs> or, or, you know, if, we, we had to sort of brew up and take, uh, take brews and teas, coffees, etc. And if if the teas or coffees weren't to the liking of the first team, you could end up with like a bit of a sort of punishment. <laughs> and uh, we used to we used to clean boots. We had to we had to uh, go and sweep Old Trafford on a Monday afternoon. You know, if there'd been a game on the Saturday, so um, yeah. and it, and it just it just keeps you grounded. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I think these days I don't know if apprentices are allowed to clean boots anymore. I'm not too sure if they remove that, but. Um, I think there's no, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of um, you know like a little bit of challenge there. Or yeah. it, it keeps your feet on the ground and and um, you know I think I think sometimes that that would be worth maybe looking at a little bit more in in sort of Premier League football, especially for the apprentices coming through. Because um, you hear rumours, don't you, of like first year pros and second year pros. Elite level teams are earning like 15, 20 grand a week. Yeah, I, I, we interviewed um, Nicky Eden, who's uh, the number, under the 21 coach at Leicester, and he said they earned more than he did in his whole yeah. career. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. He was a Premier League footballer. It's, 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 it's incredible, isn't it? And, um, yeah, I think they're you know, like, in the championship then as well. So it's a couple I of years know, ago. It's, it's, the money's phenomenal. And mm. so I think Rio Ferdinand mentioned in the papers a couple of weeks, so he's heard of like lads at Chelsea who are earning phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal sums of money hmm. and they've not even put, not even made a first team appearance so it's really incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've played regularly in the club's A, B and reserve teams. Um, what are your yeah, favourite memories? Yeah. Of, at the... What did I want, sorry? Well, a couple of your favourite memories playing in them teams. Um, yeah, I mean, we did, we did alright. I think, I think when I was there, we, we sort of, Used to win the league nine times out of ten. I think we won it. I was there four years, won it three times out of four. I remember winning the B team championship the first time that the club had done it since besties days or something. So that yeah. was nice. Uh, we went, we went, went with, um, we went to a tournament in Italy called the Grossi Marrera. In, I think it was nine ninety or something, and managed to win that. That yeah. was, I think, Ryan Giggs's first medal, possibly. Uh, at Man United, he went with the party. So I think I think Ryan was only fifteen at the time. Yeah, and uh, that was the, that was the first time that I'd ever heard Ryan Giggs because he used to, we used to know him as Ryan Wilson before then. Oh right, yeah. And um, yeah, what had happened was prior to the tournament, you used to get like officials who came in and read out 
like pa- they looked at your passport photograph and they read out your name, so your Alan Tong passport, yeah, you stand up and they sort of like just check in that, you know, there's not any sort of fakery going on or anything. Yeah. And they were come, they come round to Ryan and they said like, Ryan Giggs, and everyone in the dressing room was thinking, who's, who's Ryan Giggs? Never heard of Ryan Giggs, you know, we, we knew him as Ryan Wilson, so, so anyway, Ryan stood, stood up and obviously from that day on, um, you know, we, we certainly know who it is now, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, so in 1991 you moved to Exeter City. And what prompted the move? Well, I think I think at sort of United. I think at United at the time they had they had a lot of players in front of me. They had like Viv Anderson was sort of in front of me. And the problem that I faced at the time is the full backs could switch, or Lee Martin could play right back or left back. Yeah. Clay, Clayton Blackmore could play left back or right back. We even had like Mick Phelan playing at right full back. Mickey Duxbury was a right full back. Yeah. Tony Gill was a. <laughs> I was well down the pecking order to be fair. Yeah. So, so I think um, around that time I kind of sort of I don't know. If it was a new challenge. I had to move on because I wasn't getting in the first team. So I ended up um, down, going down to Exeter City. Uh, the manager at the time there, Alan Ball, was an mm. unbelievable person. Um, he was. When I was at United as a first year, I went on a tour to Russia yeah. as part of, uh, I represented the Football League and we played the Russian League in, a, in some sort of anniversary. Yeah. And Alan Ball and, Alan Ball and Laurie McMenemy were the managers of the party at the time. All right. So, because so, they had a reasonable game in that and, and did okay, I think Alan remembered me from sort of a couple of years ago and he, he gave me an opportunity to go and play down Exeter City, which was... Again, a, a really good experience. Really enjoyed my time down there. What, what, what level were Exeter at at that time? Le- Exeter at that time were flitting towards. They were they were kind of um, League One, League Two. Exeter, yeah, um, yeah fl- flitting between the two. Um, I think we we had one season where we just just managed to stay up. I think I think it went down to the last game of the season. We had to go to Fulham. We were down yeah. in the lower echelons back then, and we managed to get a point and, and stay in the division, which was which was you know quite stressful. And um, you know we had a, we had a bit of a run. I, we was we was one kick away. I was one kick away from from getting a Wembley appearance yeah. <laughs> in the in the in the autoglass trophy. It was called back then. Um, we got a horrendous penalty given against us that that. Uh, that killed killed us on a trip to Wembley, so we, we had like a good run in, in that trophy. So yeah, but you know some some good memories. Played with some good players down there, and uh, like I say, some some great experiences, and um, really enjoyed my time. Yeah, so that, then your your career was unfortunately cut short by injury. Um, so yeah. do you think um, young players should have a future a plan for the future? Yeah, I think I think Chris they're getting the working the working more and more on this. I think in, you know I was listening to Paul Lake on the radio just an hour ago on BBC Radio Manchester. Yeah, and, it, and Paul works for the uh, the Premier League, and he was saying that a lot of people now, a lot of clubs are working on the educational side. Mm. Uh, the work they're working on a lot of players getting opportunities outside of football. If if you don't quite make it, you know there's there's opportunities maybe to retrain as fitness coaches or performance analysts or, mm. or you know general coaches. So I think I think there's more opportunities now than there used to be. So how important are the that, PFA and helping? That that, oh, yeah, well the, the, the PFA. The thing with the PFA because they never forget you. You know no. whether you've been a member in 1952 <laughs> or whatever it is. You know they, they'll never forget you if you contacted them in relation to anything. Yeah. Um, which, which is fantastic, and um, I think the PFA, you know, they, they help in relation to your train, your retraining. They can uh, give you grants towards certain things. So, you know, the, the PFA, the PFA are a very important union, and you know, they're always there on the end of the fold, even though you've been out of the game a number of years. They'll never forget you. They'll never turn the back on you if you've got an issue or a problem. Right, so, how important is it for footballers to have a life away from the game? Very important. Very important. I think. I think I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing a bit of work on this at the moment. I'm writing a PhD on on um, on this sort of area where if players just have, they just focus 
based on a football based identity and they, yeah. they think they're a player they're a football player and nothing else that can have like a, you know a, a catastrophic effects when you have to leave the game because you've no other identities you, you know that everything that you've done is just focused on, on I am a footballer yeah and you know Football's a brutal industry. You can be top of the tree one season, you can be out of the game in a, in a couple. You know the statistics prove it. Yeah, it's something like, like is it no point no one will ever be a pro or uh, it's ninety odd percent of people who enter football at sixteen as apprentices won't be yeah, in the game yeah. at twenty one. So it, Actually, it yeah, I'm sure I read an article that seventeen. No, it was seven hundred apprentices got released last summer across the football. Oh, it's frightening, Chris, and, and if you look at those guys, you know, in, in those particular crop of uh, of people, there will be people who are heartbroken, people who have, you know, that, that's a massive, a massive uh, rejection to get over at that age. Because, yeah. you, you know, you, you're, still, you're still young, you know, you will bounce back from it, you will get back from it, but at the time, you feel as though your world's caved in, you know, it's... I can, I can remember vividly Sir Alex telling me I didn't thought you know, I wasn't in his plans, and mm. he, he told me that uh, I didn't have a future in the first. You know, I wasn't going to get in the first team, and, and you know, I, I can still remember that, even though that's now what I'm, uh, I'm 44 next birthday. Eight, that was that was when I was 19, so even now, like 25 years on, yeah, I can still recall that vividly. You know, so. It's, uh, I don't think it ever leaves you, but because uh, you, you know a lot of these guys have been playing since they were five, six year old, and they've mm. come through academies and things like that, and then to get told at eighteen you're not getting a professional contract is, it's you know it's, it's it's a real brutal rejection, but you know yeah, that, like anything else, you've got to collect yourself together, look at your options, and try and move on. And I know a lot obviously try and get another club and, and fixed up somewhere else, and there's options to go to America now and China, so. There's, there's some fantastic stuff, but um, I think I think that's how the game's really improved over the, over this last year or two. There's, there's more options now for young players mm. in relation to, to sorting the futures out. As you briefly mentioned it then, but you're currently a lecturer in sports research. Can you tell us a bit about that's your right, role? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I've, I've been teaching for um, when when I come out of the game. I, I've, I had to come out of the game at 24. Uh, which was, you know, really sad. Yeah. I had a few. I had a few years, two or three years, where I was quite long. Lost. I didn't know what to do. Uh, done a, a range of jobs. I was driving vans. I was working in warehouses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I want to get better. I want to do more. I, I, I can do. I can do more. So I went yeah. back to university as a mature student. Uh, picked up a sports science degree. And then, following my sports science degree, Chris, I went back and did a I did a teacher training qualification. Yeah. Uh, I think a couple of the lecturers at uh, University of Bolton were very insp- inspirational. Um, a lad called Paul Russell and Andy Fallone. Um, you know, they, they were absolutely brilliant lecturers, and, and they really inspired me to retrain as a tutor. Because you know, you go through your degree sometimes, and you're still not sure about which direction you're going on on that particular program. But yeah. I just felt, I just felt, you know, I'd, I'd maybe like a career here in education, in teaching. So, so I did my PGC after that, and uh, I've been, in, I've been teaching now for over eleven years. So, uh, I really enjoy it, really enjoy it. So, yeah. Yeah, I've had a couple of um, listeners' questions sent in before we finish. Um, yeah. yeah. Ethan asks, um, rumours are that you were at Sir Alex Ferguson's first signing at United. Is this true? <laughs> well. I think I think if you, if you get any trivial pursuit question, Chris, yeah. who says who's United's first sign under Ferguson, it'll be Viv Anderson. Viv Anderson. Viv Anderson. Viv Anderson was the first fee signing. Yeah. You know, they, they paid I think eight hundred grand for Viv. Whereas if you ask for the first signing, not a fee. Yeah. It, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be myself. Yeah. Um, I signed. I signed for United. I've still got the slip in the in the cupboard somewhere, and it says on there. I think it, well, I was registered about January 1987. Yeah. So obviously Ferguson joined, Sir Alex joined in 1986, November. Yeah. So if anyone if anyone can be that like, in the interim and prove the slip uh, <laughs> before 16th for January 87, they can they can take the crown. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> right, so, um, do you think that Man United will ever 
regain the dominance of the English English game? I, th- I think it's getting harder. I think every season's getting harder because I think a lot of teams are catching up now. Chris and a lot of, a lot of teams have got the financial power. Yeah. Um, when, see, Manchester United when they got their dominance in sort of when it started in the, in the early nineties when they won the Premier League. You know, they, they brought a lot of kids in, Beckham, Giggs, uh, Scholes, uh, and, the, and the, you know, they were they were sort of accompanied by a couple of brilliant signings. Dennis Irwin was a great signing, eight hundred and fifty yeah. grand that they paid for him. They got Cantona for a million. So yeah. if you look at that back then, you think that, that was the start of it all. And from then, United's dominance for me, it earned them that spending power. You know, you could say, well. We've won the league here with like your loads of youngsters and a, and a, and a mixture of, of, of good signings. They got, they got a and good, that, they got a good defence. It looks like Pat was Palace. There was only two million, wasn't he? Yeah. Absolutely, and, yeah, absolutely. Drew, Palace, Drew, 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 Scott, uh, Drew Scott about you know, fifteen, Rob, Rob sixteen Rob goals a season. Rob, yeah, Rob, <laughs> Rob was just coming to the end of his career back then, and yeah. they, you know, they had some really, really good professionals, and and from that they went on to dominate. Certainly, you know, up, up until up until um, you know the present day, we, you know, we won the. Premier League a couple of years ago, but I think since then, you know, obviously your Chelsea's have, have, have managed to acquire a very wealthy owner, Roman Abramovich, since you've got Sheikh Mansour in. Mm. Um, you know, you look at the sort of Premier League at the moment, Chris Tottenham are doing really well, Leicester have come from nowhere, so I think every season Chris is getting harder and harder to, to sort of, you know, set down markers, but um, I know United are supposed to be having a, a big sort of well certainly in the academy a big root and branch review at the moment and yeah. um, you know there's, there's obviously rumours about Louis Van Gaal's future and whether he's going to be staying for you know past this, this season etc etc so I think we'll, we'll be sort of probably seeing a little bit of change again shortly but you know we'll just have to wait and see so you know United are built on bouncing back and coming back from adversity so um, you know we'll, we'll just have to see see what happens and see if they can get, get back challenging again I think the the difficulty for United this season is to get a top four place, and mm. we t- we talking like that with twelve games to go is really, really strange. You know, United, are, a lot of supporters are saying, "Oh, we've no chance of getting top four. We've still got thirty six points to play for, so we've got to try and come. what our ideal one is to, be to flip over City, City drop yeah. out the top four, and we, and we pick the fourth place. That'd be, well, that'd I think in a lot of United but, fans were hoping Leicester were going to drop off, and we'll just kind of creep in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think Leicester have been unbelievable, haven't they? And they you know, arguably, Chris, very, very unfortunate yesterday at Arsenal. You know, yeah. uh, they got they got they got done by the last you know the last header of the game, didn't they? Mm. There was no time to kick off after it. So, uh, and then Tottenham's display at the Etihad was was different class. Yeah. So it it's, it's interesting. It's it's a real. It's going to be a real intriguing finish. You know, the sport teams chasing there. If you put you know still include City in that. So. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a few twists and turns over this next 12 games, how there always is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alright, so before we finish, do you want to plug your um, social media or any websites? Or? Well, you know, I, you, you can. I, I'm on social media. I'm on Twitter as Alan underscore Tom, A L A N underscore T O N G E. And uh, we also, I also am a, a sports lecturer now at the, uh, the UCFB, um, yeah. which is a an establishment which offers degrees in the football industry. We have degrees in marketing, business, sports coaching, uh, media, journalism. Uh, we're hopefully getting a football science master's degree validated. So, yeah. so if anybody's, you know, any any other listeners interested in sort of applying for UCSB, uh, you'll find you'll find us on the website and have a look at some of the some of the courses that we offer. And uh, we have certain open days as well coming up. So. Uh, we're, we're moving. We're, we've got a campus at the Etihad starting yeah. from September, so we're, we're moving over there. So, uh, absolutely unbelievable facilities to learn in. We have the Etihad Stadium. We've got a sta- uh, campus at Wembley, Wembley Stadium. Mm. Uh, we're currently in Turf Moor at the moment, Burnley's ground, and, and um, it's, it's a great field to have uh, a learning environment where you can. Sp- you know, discuss all everything, contemporary issues in football, business, marketing, digital media, journalism, overlooking the pitch while you're doing it, you know, it, it's unbelievable. So if any listeners are interested in finding out some more information, uh, nip onto UCFB's site and have a little read about us. 
All right, so I've, I've really enjoyed speaking here tonight. I'd love to have you on our main podcast one day to discuss the week's oh, news. Really so on, but, so. It's been really enjoyable. Oh, Thanks very much for the football and okay. great stuff.